Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jesse with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I know many of you have been with us every single Wednesday for the past gajillion weeks. Uh, but if this is your first time joining us, thank you for joining our virtual advocate forum. We're having these every week. So uh, please join us um, every week from now on. We are so excited to have Lieutenant Governor slash Secretary of Education and Workforce Development, Jacqueline Coleman with us this morning. I think it's really, it's like extra cool when you get a slash in your job title. So um, I think that makes you just like doubly awesome and we're doubly excited to have you here. Oh, uh, just you. a heads up to everybody that our conversation today is gonna be recorded and released as a podcast. Um, so the interview with Terry and Lieutenant Governor Coleman, um, Nobody's going to hear any of you because uh, you are all muted, but just a heads up, but please share your questions in the chat box. Um, we won't have time to address those during this forum, but this is like part one of a series on education and the questions that you share in there can help us inform um, the content and questions that we ask in upcoming forums. So um, we would really appreciate all the questions and <clears throat> comments uh, that you uh, may have. And so please, please feel free to share those. And with that, I am gonna turn this over to Terry, who is gonna get us started today. Okay, great. Thanks, Jesse. I'm sure uh, everybody's on the same page as, as you know. Uh, we have been doing these Wednesday forums uh, now around the theme of kids and COVID-19. Uh, you'll recall that, for instance, we had House and Senate majority and minority leadership on to talk about uh, when the session ended. Uh, you all have had a chance to interact with uh, members of Leader McConnell's staff as they crafted the uh, third and fourth editions of the uh, CARES Act. Uh, you'll recall we launched a two or three week series beginning with Secretary Friedlander uh, on the, the, uh, the wide, wide scope that uh, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services cover. Uh, we talked about health, we talked about child care, we talked about child abuse. So we, we've done a number of those venues. And uh, today we're really beginning a, a three-parter on kids, COVID, and K-12. Uh, as Jesse indicated, uh, this week we have a solo appearance by Lieutenant Governor slash Secretary Coleman. Next week, uh, we're going to have uh, a representative from uh, the teacher union, Brent McKim from JCTA. We have the uh, newly elected president of the state PTA. Uh, we have Dean Elizabeth Dinkins from Bellarmine and one of the uh, one of the participants today, Dr. Minahan, uh, who, who runs the Ohio Valley Education Cooperative, is going to be on representing not just OVEC, but the superintendent, administrator, and school board associations. Then the, uh, the week after that, we're going to have uh, Interim Commissioner Brown and uh, Board Chair Lou Young on uh, to talk about it from there. So we really want to give uh, K-12 and we're going to bleed into a couple other areas with the lieutenant governor today, but, but we're going to do a, a three-week focus on K-12 because that's such a, a critical issue. <clears throat> so as Jesse indicated, we're, we're really pleased to have uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman on. Uh, I need to be very transparent to say that uh, I'm running to be president of her fan club. Uh, any interaction that we have had with her is just so impressive. And, and I'll tell you why she's most impressive. Some of you will not know who this is, but I, I bet the Lieutenant Governor knows. Uh, Pat Summit is the uh, perhaps most legendary women's basketball coach uh, ever. And she has a wonderful quote, attitude is a choice. What you think you can do, whether positive or negative, confidence or scared, will most likely happen. And so as former basketball coach, uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman really reflects that. Uh, and any time I hear her talk about leadership, I walk away impressed because she is such a thinker. So, Lieutenant Governor, welcome. And I'd, I'd kind of like to start with some broader topics. One I just led into, uh, whether it's Pat Summit or Jacqueline Coleman, I, I love people talking about uh, leadership. And uh, I guess I'm curious what leadership ideas 
have been affirmed? And what are some lessons you never anticipated learning uh, from these uh, unprecedented times? Again, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. And I am um, one of the many uh, young girls who grew up during the 90s and think Pat Summit hung the moon. So I kind of uh, thought you might be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. I really do. Um, so thank you guys for having me and thank you for having this important conversation. Um, at, you know, as many of you know, I have uh, worked really hard to make sure that public education uh, stays a part of the policy conversation because it's my belief that it impacts everything that goes on in the state. Every policy issue we have, um, education is at least part of the solution, in my opinion. Um, and so uh, you're right, Terry, uh, when I think about um, trying to be a leader during um, a time where we could have never predicted what might happen. I mean, if you just, if you just go back to um, when we were sworn into office, we did not have any idea that within a couple months, this is what we would be dealing with. Um, and so this is what I can tell you. When you are, um, when you seek to be a leader, it's got to be for, for reasons that um, are, not, are never about you. It's always got to be about serving other people. And so um, what you have to be able to do is take that service and make it applicable in good times and in bad, right? So just because we're in, actually, especially because we're in bad times, service to others is more needed now than ever. Um, and so I could go to the, the, uh, the focus points that the, that the governor and I had when we first started this administration, we asked the question, where are we going? And the W stood for wages, the H for healthcare, the E for education, the R for retirements, and the last E for example. And so what I can tell you is we are still working on the, in those arenas. It's just in a very different way than we thought we would be, right? So we're still focusing on wages and healthcare and education, but they're more important now than they've ever been. Um, and so in terms of leadership, it's, it's a message that's got to resonate across, um, across time and across <coughs> sectors of the, of the population, and it's got to be always in service to other people. And so um, while I had hoped to work on education as, as Lieutenant Governor, certainly the way that I'm working on education is very different now than I could have ever imagined. I appreciate that. Uh, I had an opportunity last Friday, we did a dual forum, and forum with uh, Secretary Friedlander and Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher. And uh, I asked them the same question, and I, I kind of like the question, so I'm going to pose it to you as well. Uh, Winston Churchill asserts that any crisis is pockmarked by unexpected difficulties and uplifted by surprising winds. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of that yin-yang thing. And, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, I'm sure that you, the governor, and, and Kentucky's senior leadership team, has run into that. Some things that you thought were impossible have become wins. Some things that you may have thought were doable look like mountains. Can you, can you talk in a broad way about that yin-yang of unexpected difficulties and positive surprises? I can. Um, so, you know, when the governor and I ran, we ran in what anybody would recognize is a very difficult political atmosphere. Um, as Democrats. We, we're obviously both Democrats. Um, we ran during a time where um, the other party has got, has maintained a supermajority in the House and Senate, and every other uh, constitutional office was run by Republicans. Um, was won by Republicans tonight that we won. And so this is who we are anyway, but it certainly was a necessity at this point. Um, and, and one of our unexpected wins was bipartisanship. Um, we, we created this Team Kentucky uh, mentality from the beginning, um, and the pandemic has made it more true than we ever had hoped it would be true, honestly. Um, but we um, practiced what we preached, and we met with um, folks from both sides of the aisle. We um, compromised on issues where we could. We pushed issues out first that we could all agree on. Um, and then in the other areas, 
we agreed to disagree and that happens. Um, but certainly um, we took this pandemic as an opportunity to unify Kentuckians and that means in political party as well. And so I feel like one of our unexpected wins was probably getting more um, bipartisanship across Kentucky and not just with elected officials, but with, with citizens across Kentucky than we probably could have imagined. Um, I think one of the toughest areas uh, that has arisen is um, in times like this um, where people are scared and things are uncertain, it often gives rise to extremists. And I think we've seen that um, across Kentucky um, with the way that some folks have chosen to respond to the pandemic. And so um, while we have been very fortunate to um, create a bipartisan coalition and forge Team Kentucky forward, um, we still have to deal with extremists that um, are out there that are not going to change their mind no matter what. Um, those voices are very few, but they're very loud. And so making sure that you stay focused on what the goal is and know that if 90% of Kentucky is with you, you can't let the other 10% um, hijack the conversation and, and move it in a direction that you don't want it to go. So that's been, that's been uh, um, something that was difficult, I thought, for me uh, to deal with. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful answer. Let's pivot from those broader issues of leadership to uh, more public policy issues. And I'd like to start with the bottom line of the bottom line. Uh, there are two competing narratives, and it, they really leave me uh, confused because just what you mentioned, they both seem to be extreme. Uh, one narrative suggests that Kentucky is going to be flat busted. I know that's not good grammar as a former teacher or lieutenant governor, but you get the point. So, you know, we're going to be flat busted. Uh, we're going to have unprecedented cuts to key services. Uh, it's going to be a desert. Uh, the counter narrative is unprecedented federal funds, lots of flexibility, opportunities for imaginative solutions. Secretary Friedlander talked about that around child welfare. Uh, but you hear sort of either or, and I, I guess I'm wondering uh, what's the Jacqueline Coleman? Is there a third iterative where they're both right, they're both wrong? What are the factors at play? What do y'all know and what don't you know? So as we sit here today, what do you think the fiscal scene is for the Commonwealth now and moving forward? So I think um, as odd as it sounds, both narratives have a little bit of truth to them. Um, but this is what I always told my players. So if, if, if any of my players were in this room right now, there would be a collective eye roll because I said this <laughs> so many times when I coached them. But it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it that matters. And so um, one of, I think it was Rahm, um, Rahm Emanuel who said, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and so I tend to lean towards the latter, which is we have an opportunity right now to really dig in. And we're gonna be forced because of budget cuts to be more efficient um, and more effective with every dollar that we have. But we also have an immense opportunity in front of us to streamline our services, to amplify the difference that we're able to make for Kentuckians. And it's funny that you're mentioning Secretary Friedlander because he and I have met on several occasions. Our cabinets overlap in a lot of different ways, whether it's Friskies and, um, you know, K-12 education, uh, child care, um, workforce development, all of those things. We have so many things that we, that we both do from different angles. And so we both see this as an opportunity and it's going to, um, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a reason, not that we need a reason, but it is a reason to um, work together to make real transformational change in Kentucky. And here's what I mean by that. So I'll give you an example with the Team Kentucky Fund. That's something that we've been working on. I'm sure you all have seen um, uh, the governor talk about it on the nightly um, press briefings. And so um, he, he came up with that idea. He said, I want you to take this and run with it. And, um, and I did. And so if we had just taken Team Kentucky and said, uh, or the Team Kentucky Fund and said, okay, we're gonna raise money 
and we're going to um, cut checks to families who need it. And that's how we're going to help. That would be fine. And that would be, that would be part of a solution, but that wasn't enough for me because I'm an athlete and a coach. And so I was want to take one more step. Right. So we partnered with community action of Kentucky um, so that they could help us distribute these funds. So now what's going to happen is when these folks apply for funding from the team Kentucky fund, they will have access to those funds, but they also have access to all of the services that CAK provides. So now they're going to have um, help to lower their utility rates through LIHEAP. They're going to have access to workforce development and training opportunities, apprenticeships, free GED programs, childcare, um, job placement. We know that, that it's been estimated that it could be that 40% of uh, people do not return to the same job they had before this. So people are going to be looking for employment. So that's a way, that's an, that's a way to help people in the here and now, but it's also an investment that we're going to make in the family and in the next generation of Kentuckians. And so that's the mentality that we have to have. It's not just enough to plug the holes. It's not just enough to try to get by. Yes, we do have to do that, but that should not be where we stop. We've got to make sure that we continue to figure out how we can invest in our families and programs that will support our families and our kids um, to create true transformational change. Okay, great. So I wanna go from the, the fiscal notion to a couple of the arenas that you clearly are formally and informally in charge of. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna to turn to an arena where you and I both share a biography uh, around K-12. Uh, yesterday, uh, I just need to say to participants, uh, we at KYA had a, a really deep and what I thought was a very positive conversation with senior leadership from the Department of Education, uh, from the uh, folks who have been appointed to the state board uh, and the Lieutenant Governor's office. So we, we talked about everything from uh, high stakes accountability next year to gap uh, analysis to returning to school, just a whole range. And Lieutenant Governor, rather than asking you a, sort of a staccato series of specific questions, uh, I'd rather you kind of dig in uh, at a broad level and just talk to us about what's on your mind. Uh, I love the fact that you look at this sector as a parent, as an educator, and as Secretary of Education. So you got a lot of lenses going. Uh, when you're thinking about 2021, uh, what are the three or four or five or six uh, areas that are really uh, most uh, challenging and inspiring and haunting and uh, prioritized in your head? So I, I, I've said this um, in, in several um, corners uh, as we have conversations about this pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has clearly created um, a new set of issues that we have to address, but they're not all new. Some of them have just been magnified. And we, are, we have reached a point where um, we no longer have the privilege uh, to ignore uh, the, the issues that um, specific sectors of our economy and of our communities face. Um, we know that, for instance, the uh, pandemic has had a, a, uh, a sizable impact on African-American communities. Um, that's not a COVID-19 issue. That's a healthcare issue, right? And that, so this, this is not something that's new. It's just something that we can no longer pretend it's not happening for those who are pretending it's not happening. Um, we have inequity in our school systems that um, are debilitating for some students. Um, that has never been more evident than when we had to go to online classes. And then you have the technology hurdle, you have the um, broadband hurdle, um, you have the hurdle of kids who have parents who are at home to help them and those who don't. Um, and so those inequities, that's why our public school system exists, is to level that playing field. And so we have, we have a big, bright, shining light over us right now that will not let us pretend like that's happened yet. And we have to continue to, to keep moving forward. Um, so, you know, all of those challenges that we typically face, they really haven't changed. They've just become a little bit more of an emergency, which 
I'm thankful for because there are issues that we have to address on behalf of our kids and our families. And, and that can, a lot of that can be done through our public school system. So as we return, one of the issues that we have to, um, we're gonna have to address now more than ever, and Secretary Friedlander and I are working on this together too, is the mental health component in our school systems. If you thought that kids suffered from uh, mental health issues before that have gone unaddressed, wait till they come back from being at home for as long as they have been in certain situations. Um, you know, again, child abuse <coughs> is an issue that we are all concerned about. Um, about us, I mean, this group, that has uh, absolutely unequivocally been exacerbated with the stress that's been put on families financially, with the fact that uh, many families are at home um, constantly together, and that stress is just eating, eating away at the core, and, and a lot of people can't leave home and go to other places. Um, and so, you know, the, the uh, welfare of our students, the health of our students, um, the inequities that exist in our school systems, uh, the mental health issues that are absolutely going to amplify are all challenges that we have kind of been addressing and we've not really been in a big hurry and we've we talk about the issues and we do we do a little bit and we and we try to help but it's to the point now where um it can no longer be ignored um by the folks who are trying to ignore it, it the, these are major issues that can be fixed through public policy but we've got to have folks to get on board and, and make sure that we're all fighting for the same thing here. Um, and so th those challenges are huge, um, huge challenges. And I know like I have friends in, um, who teach in Fayette County. One teaches at a, at a at school that is predominantly Hispanic. And so then they have the language barrier on top of the technology barrier, barrier on top, you know, on, on all of those other things. And so, um, we have to be we have to be more conscious of, of how we communicate um, with our families as well. So, okay. can you can you talk as a uh, again part of the power of perspective that you bring is it wasn't that long ago that not only were you not a school administrator but you were a classroom teacher, uh, and so I'm just trying to wrap my head around uh, we we none of us know how. Uh, kids are going to return to schools, but you hear all of those complexities of who needs masks and who needs temperature checks and how far should the desk be spaced away from each okay. other and are we having an A day and a B day and a et cetera. Uh, my sense is that it's almost impossible to begin to think about that because we, we don't know where the pandemic sits. Uh, you have some preliminary thoughts or it's like you just want to kind of wait until we get a status report uh you know early june type of a thing where where is a again not not really as lieutenant governor even but just you're a classroom teacher uh what are you wondering about oh gosh and you know I, i've had these conversations with lots of education groups across the state um just to kind of think through it and talk out loud um, my <clears throat> recommendation has been um, that we allow districts as much flexibility as we can in um, figuring out what's best for their students and their families and their community. So for example, my husband, Chris, teaches at Frankfurt High School. It's a tiny school, you know, 200 or so high school kids. Um, they don't really even operate buses because all the kids walk to school. Um, it's just a very different atmosphere than it probably is at Henry Clay High School, right? Like there's a whole different uh, bag of worms that we got to open in a big school. And so what I really hope that we are able to do is to give districts as much flexibility as they need, because as I talk through this, you know, here's one, so here's the first issue. And again, the pandemic is amplifying these challenges. It didn't create it. Our, our school transportation system, is funded at about 60% if we're lucky. So now when we talk about um, transporting students, in reality, these buses can only carry about half as many students at one time as they could before. So are we going to double transportation cost when it, we're already only covered at half of what we need, essentially? Um, then you talk about once you get them to school, 
Um, yeah, they might be spaced out on buses, but the bus routes and the school schedules don't necessarily go together. So then when you get them to school, you got, you got to, like you said, keep the desk separate and, and all kinds of things. And then you got to think about the um, common areas. So lunchrooms, gyms, bathrooms. Um, as an assistant principal, I just about had a heart attack at trying to think about how you would keep kids in the hallway um, six feet apart. Yeah. Like I can't even, I can't even talk about it. Uh, yeah. How do you socially, how do you socially distance sophomores? <laughs> I, 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 yeah. So um, it, it's those things that in, in, in my experience, I have, I have literally stood in the hallways and, and, and done these things. And so when these, these challenges come up, it's not like we're dealing with adults like that are in cubicles or, you know, have specific workplace workspaces. Uh, we're, de we're dealing with kids and we're dealing with a social setting because that's, that's, you know, when you're not in class, it's a social setting everywhere else. Um, and so they, it's going to be hard like to, to act like we can just come up with a new schedule or a new bus route and that's going to fix everything is not even close to being true. And that's why we have to make sure that our school leaders are at the table. Our teachers are at the table. Our parents who are concerned about sending their kids back to school are at the table because we've got to be able to think through the challenges that they're going to face from their perspective, not a perspective of in the Capitol in Frankfurt, um, but in a perspective of boots on the ground. You can't just make these policies and then tell people to be innovative and figure it out. Because if I heard that one more time in the classroom, I was going to lose it. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's got it's, it's got to be in a way that uh, you provide flexibility but also support in helping um, these these voices be heard yeah I do want to uh, lieutenant governor I just want to kind of share with our participants uh, an invitation uh, and you all know this on any issue but uh, we would love to hear your ideas and concerns at kya as we work with uh, the folks in Frankfurt uh, yesterday uh, again it's a credit to the lieutenant governor uh, the state board and KDE. Uh, I mean, we raised issues like uh, a real call to ensure that there is not high stakes, uh, high pressure accountability in the spring of 21. I, I cannot imagine teachers and principals operating in that environment. Uh, I see Larry Mahalachek on this call. Uh, we had a deep discussion around uh, alternative facilities for young people in juvenile justice and child welfare, their educational programming. Uh, and we heard nothing but uh, openness. So I, I do wanna just say to folks on the call, uh, don't just be listeners to the Lieutenant Governor. We want you to be a listener today to the Lieutenant Governor, but we want you to think about her words and the issues that you see and let us hear from you because we really do detect from the administration and openness to, to work together. So uh, that's my little sermonette, Lieutenant Governor, to folks on the call here. So, uh, and do you, uh, let me ask you a really, uh, this is an impossible to answer question, so I'm sure you appreciate oh, me asking it. Yeah, <laughs> so, so is, is the, you know, I'm a parent and I'm sitting, whether it's in Southeast Kentucky or the middle of downtown Louisville, uh, is, is when we know what's gonna happen is really the best word, just kind of uncomfortably hang loose. I mean, because in, until we know the broader public health issues, we're not gonna know anything about schools. I, I hear a lot of people trying to get deadlines and I just, I can't imagine how y'all can talk deadlines at this point. Is that an accurate read? That, that is. And, you know, we, uh, as we start to kind of reopen the economy and, and move back um, to whatever our new normal is, um, we're making these decisions, these timelines based on the assumption that people are going to do what they're supposed to do. Um, I, I keep saying in every meeting we have about these things that I'm worried because we're not exactly a culture of moderation. So we tend to, it's either all or nothing. And so, you know, I, on Memorial Day weekend, I'm just going to hunker down and hope for the best because I just hope that people don't go out and go nuts. Um, when, when the sun comes out and it gets pretty outside and all that kind of stuff, we still have to be very, um, very careful um, and still follow all of those guidelines. Otherwise, we're just going to keep setting ourselves back. And so at each benchmark, 
we'll look at where we are and then we'll set new benchmarks. And that's, that's the best that we can do uh, in, in assuming that people will do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Are you ashamed or proud that I almost got in a fight with someone at curbside last night because they weren't wearing a mask? You think I should have just restrained or that? That's uh, so I was I was going to ask a, a question before yesterday, but I think I can still ask it. My uh, my hypothesis was going to be that as we talk about reopening the economy, the three major factors are child care, child care <clears throat> and child care. Uh, and I guess yesterday we heard child care is being addressed. Uh, you have some early on thoughts as to how that's going to look or it's too early to talk about it. Uh, can you bring us up to date on where you, the governor and other key leaders are on that reopening process? Well, and let me say this, um, when, when I talk about how the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of challenges that we face, um, what it's also done is, is it, is hex, it has exposed um, the, the lack of respect that we have for the services that we take for granted, like yeah. childcare and grocery store workers and education and healthcare, you know, all of those things that, um, you know, childcare was something that I think, um, people just assumed was always going to be there and we were always going to have, and it was just going to work the way it was supposed to. And now where we find ourselves <coughs> is it is, foundational to our economic success. I mean, this is an, e this is an economic development issue. It's not just a childcare issue. And so um, I know we have, we have folks um, from the governor's office of early childhood uh, education, which is in my cabinet, working with some folks from CFHS to uh, CHFS, sorry. Um, Cause one of my goals is to shatter silos. That's what I call it. We all get siloed into our one area. We need to come together and, and put all these perspectives together so I'm working on that too. Um, they're working on a proposal um, that would ultimately go to um, the Department of Public Health for um, approval before the governor signs off on it. So I can tell you that those plans are being um, crafted by the folks who um, are in early childhood development, um, early childhood education, those types of things. So we are working on that. And this is one of those things that I would say, you know, as, as we go back to whatever this new normal or go to this new normal, whatever it's gonna be, we need to really think hard about the things that are worth going back to, right? So if there is a, if there is a time and a way to change some of the processes and, um, and values, that we have, it's right now. And so this is the perfect time um, to elevate this conversation about childcare and early childhood education in Kentucky. Um, and you better believe that I will grab that microphone and we will yeah. talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great. Well, you're, and you're so right. This is a double negative on purpose, but no one doesn't not know the value of childcare right now, do they? Right. Oh, yeah. That's that's really become sensitized. So the other big hat that you wear is that whole area of workforce. And heaven knows uh, you talk about an arena that uh, presents unprecedented issues. So mm -hmm. we hear a lot about, you know, unemployment and we hear about both benefits and the actual economic conditions. Uh, give us that 30,000 look, <clears throat> foot look from where you sit as to employment and workforce and benefits and return and phases. So uh, I'll, I, I would just kind of invite you to riff a little bit about that part of the cabinet that you had. So um, I'm sure you've all heard um, lots of things about unemployment insurance because uh, the amount of people who have applied in Kentucky is astronomical. Um, and, and so I will say this, we've, we've had about just over 700,000 700, claims for, for unemployment insurance. Um, our cabinet has processed that many at a, an 88 to 90% rate, which is unheard of nationwide. Uh, there, are, there are states that are processing at maybe 50% if they're lucky. Um, and so, you know, within four weeks after this pandemic started, we had processed twice as many unemployment claims in four weeks as we did in all of 2019. 
So it, it, it's just outrageous. We had 12 people answering the phones when we first started in this administration. Now we have hundreds and hundreds across the state. Um, so the, the improvements we've had to make to this system had to be made very quickly. They were not made quick enough because it just wasn't physically possible to make them quick enough. But it's a reminder that we can't starve the systems that people depend on in Kentucky. You know, when we're operating with 12 people answering the phones across the state, that's not good enough. Even, even not in a pandemic, that's not good enough. But it certainly left us in a position to where we had to scale up at, at a rate that was almost impossible. Um, and with all of that said, I'm very proud of, of the folks that have been working on this and they've worked extremely hard. There was one day where we had to tell people at 4.30 in the morning to go home. Wow. I mean, that's, that's the truth. Um, and so they, they've worked so extremely hard and it is, it's personal. When you get these people who are panicked that they don't know where their next meal is coming from, they don't, they can't pay their bills. It, it, it's not just a name on a screen, it is personal and it worries me every time I see something like that. And so with all of that success, what I will tell you is that 10 to 12% makes me physically ill. When I think, when we talk about it, when we think about it, when we try to figure out how to get to those folks and help them, um, because they've got to be our focus. And so that's where most of our focus through unemployment insurance lies. Now, as I said before, when we go back to work, about 40% of these people estimated are not going to go back to the same job. And so now we're going to have a whole nother issue in terms of what is the economy going to look like moving forward? What skills do people need to be able to go from you know, X uh, job to Y job. Um, what skills can we embed in our K-12 system, in our uh, higher ed system, in, in whatever that looks like, whether that's apprenticeships or college, that are transferable, right? So for example, communication, uh, digital citizenship, um, resilience, all of those things that are actually skills that some of us learn the hard way um, should be skills that are taught across um, the, the subject areas. It doesn't matter if you have a degree in, in history or, or engineering, you still have to know how to communicate, right? And so um, those transferable skills are going to have to be a focus of, of education moving forward. It should have been anyway, but now is certainly the time that we've got to make sure that that's happening. Okay. Thank, that's a that's a great answer, and I appreciate the diligence. Uh, it's one of those where uh, I'm sure sometimes you and your folks feel like you're, you know, going 120 percent, and people want to want to seize that one one vignette that uh, that brings folks down. So I appreciate that. Something that I, I uh, sometimes forget to do this, so I apologize to those on the call interested. When I talk about education, I tend to say K-12 and preschool. I know there is this other area called higher ed that, that some people are also uh, pay attention to. Uh, what's that scene? We were talking before the call started uh, about universities opening. Uh, I was actually talking about it in the context of college football, but uh, others oh. want to uh, know about it just in terms of uh, academics of how does that work in Kentucky? So I'm asking a question I probably know, should know the answer to. There's gonna be guidelines and each institution charts its own course or public institutions chart their courses and private ones do their thing. How, how will that look as community colleges, universities, other kind of uh, post-secondary options think about the fall? Uh, well, so first, let me say that, you know, I'm, I'm a coach, my husband's a coach, all of our kids play for us. Um, and so we are also very worried about football and basketball season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I say that jokingly, but um, I, who knows what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Um, but in higher ed, this is one of those perfect examples of, in some situations, we have very um, antiquated systems and ways of doing things. And so as we transition into what, whatever will be our new normal, we need to think about what's worth going back to, right? And so there are ways that we can do things that are more efficient, um, that are more effective, that don't require us to be um, in these antiquated processes that we've had before. And so um, I know our, our, our higher ed systems are, um, in my opinion, they are the perfect incubators for innovation, right? So they can um, take this opportunity 
to create uh, a different class environment, a different system for um, uh, you know research or um, how how kids quote unquote go to school. Um, I know one of the issues. It's not really school the the academic part that's going to be an issue for colleges. It's going to be the issue of dorms and common place, common areas that they're going to have to be able to um, make those accommodations for, and that is that's going to be a huge undertaking. But again, I feel the same way about them that I do when we talk about K-12, which is we've got to give as much flexibility as possible, uphold the, the expectations that guidelines are followed uh, to the highest degree because people's lives are at stake, you know, health is at stake, um, and ultimately let these folks make the decisions that are best for their campus. You know, if you're talking about um, Center College in Danville, I got to give a shout out to my alma mater. That's a very different conversation for a small campus than if you're talking about U of L, uh, because there are so many more students there. Now more students are probably commuting to U of L than at Center. And so then you have the social issue that um, these colleges are going to have to address. And I, I trust our higher ed um, leaders to think through this from every angle. And this is what they do. Um, and we've got to provide that support for them when they tell us what they need. Okay, great. Uh, I want to uh, close out with a couple couple questions. One is non-policy, uh, and, and I want you to kind of coach your coach. So I want you to coach up my colleagues on the call. Uh, I've really appreciated both the governor and your very persistent refrain around building both collective resiliency, but also personal resiliency. Uh, and so talk about that challenge, uh, if you don't mind, in a personal way. I mean, how are you and your family going about self-care? And uh, the folks on this call, uh, you know, I have a feeling they may be like uh, those folks who leave at 430 and you had to tell them to leave. So I frankly worry about a lot of my colleagues uh, that they may think self-care is for everyone but self so I want you to kind of soapbox that a little bit. Talk about what y'all, what the Coleman family is doing, and then challenge these guys to emulate good practices on self-care. So what I would not recommend is having a baby in the middle of a <laughs> In case you're wondering. Uh, no, it, it, it's been great. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think it's safe to say that um, women are – far, far less likely to practice their own self-care because they're worried about everyone else in their families, whether that's, you know, kids, spouses, parents, um, uh, you know, people that they work with. Um, and so sometimes that language of love to give to others, right, that work that we do for others um, is exhausting us and we don't realize it. Um, and so uh, in our family, uh, what we what we typically do is I have got a um, jogger stroller. I don't know if somebody was trying to tell me something, but I got. A <laughs> um, I probably have not run in six or eight years. Um, I just got tired of it after I played basketball, and so I worked out, but I didn't run. Um, and so I've, I've broke the jogger stroller out and I take Evelyn out with me and, and we go for, I run is probably a little intense. It's more like a jog if I'm being honest, <laughs> but that's what we do. Um, in our house, um, we, uh, we try to get outside and do things like that, um, to be active and, and our kids go out and run too. They'll play basketball in the driveway, you know, things like that. You've got to get off your phone. Lord, get off the phone um, and, uh, you know, turn the TV off because we have 24 hour news where the coronavirus is all you hear about all day long. And it's like anxiety run amok. Right. And so um, what, what I would um, challenge you all to do is to actually be an example. You have access to social media. Everyone does. So don't just say, you need to go out and, and um, you know, take care of yourself and practice self-care. Show other people what you're doing. Because what that does is it not only shows that you're practicing what you preach, but it gives other people permission to practice self-care too, because it's hard. I know it, like it just is, it's hard because we're, we're constantly worried about other people. But if you're doing it and so somebody will look at you and say, well, Terry's doing it, then, then I need to make time to go out for a walk today, right? And so that might 
um, you know, subconsciously inspire other people to do it too, rather than just to say it out loud. So you have to be that the last E and where is example. And so you have to be the example too. Yeah. So a, an important follow-up question is that I think I'm right that that other coach Coleman uh, took his team to the state tournament last year. And uh, two of those players were your sons. Can you beat your sons in 21 in that driveway? Can you still beat them or do they beat you in 21? So this is a true story. I have never, <laughs> ever lost a game of horse ever. Uh-huh. And um, Emma, I think it was the Christmas of her sophomore year in college, she came home and I mean, she came about that close to beating me. And so mm-hmm. I retired. <laughs> then, I, I've won all of them. I'm not going to keep playing. I'm just going to go out. I'm going to go out undefeated. So I don't play them on horse anymore, but I'm the okay. reigning champion. <laughs> okay, good, good. Hey, I, I want to give you a second. Uh, I know that I believe that you wanted to invite thousands of your best friends to a uh, 2020 graduation this Saturday yeah. that, that you and the Department of Ed are throwing. Do you want to give that a little uh, pub right now? Yes, that's great. So we put together, um, myself and Kevin Brown, the, the interim commissioner, um, have put together a, a plan for a, we call it a salute to the class of 2020. And so we got um, uh, Representative Regina Huff, who is the chair of the Education Committee in the House, Senator Max Wise, who's the chairman of the uh, Senate Education Committee, um, myself and the governor and um, Kevin Brown and Lou Young, who's the chair of the uh, state board. And then we have some special guests that are going to do some pretty cool things uh, who are talented Kentuckians. Um, I, I am not a talented Kentuckian, so I can't do what they're doing, but I can be an MC, and that's what I'm doing for the, the event. So it's going to be live on our social media. Um, not live, sorry, but it'll go, it'll go on our social media, um, the governor's and mine on, um, on Saturday. And so look for that because we want to really um, uh, celebrate the senior class. We have pictures from every single public school in Kentucky. Uh, which was not an easy thing to do, but we wanted to make sure that we honored every school and this senior class for what they have sacrificed for the rest of us. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to invite you to uh, to kind of give us a rousing benediction in just a minute, but uh, I, I just wanted to, again, affirm uh, how much all of us appreciate you. You know, my, my favorite vignette, Lieutenant Governor, was that uh, on Children's Advocacy Day, uh, you were uh, very pregnant, and you had been to your you had been to that uh, Frankfurt uh, State Tournament game. But you oh, yeah. made time. You made time to make it to the end of a reception we had for young people who are in the child welfare system who were up there advocating that day. What so impressed me was it wasn't during the formal ceremony. It wasn't in a public way. But I watched you reach out to every one of those kids and have an authentic conversation with each of them. Uh, wow, that just spoke volumes. So I, I appreciate the example, that fourth or fifth E, whatever that is that, uh, uh, that you talked about, because you set that for me that day, and I appreciate it. So uh, as we close out uh, today, I just kind of give you the floor and, and – uh, invite you to give us a, a final uh, a final call for the good of the cause. Oh, well, thank you. And, and uh, you know, those kids were, they're, they're so special. And I think all of us um, can agree that, you know, we, we are in this to fight for the kids who need us the most. Um, and actually May happens to be Foster Care Awareness Month, um, which, you know, my oldest child, uh, we adopted on December 23rd. She's 22 going to be 23 in October. So it's funny when I tell people I have a 22 year old, you can see them like doing math. Um, but no, I acquired her. I didn't have her. Um, but, but what I would say is the kids that, that need us the most um, obviously show it in, in, in the least uh, loving way. Uh, but I'm just so grateful for the fact that you all are, are out there doing what you do to help kids and everybody has a different focus. Everybody has a different um, area of expertise. Um, And so I would challenge you to reach out to the kids who um, may have been forgotten or who may, may have fallen through the cracks because um, those are the ones that it's amazing what a simple 
conversation with them, what a difference that makes. They feel like they matter. And sometimes that's all they need um, it, it is an adult to see them, an adult to believe in them. And that, that's the power that you all have. Um, and I would ask you to use it and I would ask you to use it often uh, because it will make more of a difference in the next generation than you can imagine. Thank you so much. You know, along with being an MC, you just may be a rock star for Kentucky, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. And, uh, and uh, really, all of you guys are rock stars, too. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that every Wednesday, uh, we kind of have a virtual town hall, uh, Lieutenant Governor, on kids and COVID. And uh, uh, there's a lot of perfect attendance people uh, on this call today, and we appreciate it. I do want to affirm uh, what we invited you to do uh, earlier. Uh, my sense, and I think you heard that from the Lieutenant Governor, is that the K-12 scene is in a very formative stage right now as we look ahead. So don't be passive and wait for decisions to be made and then shake your head. Uh, so let us know, uh, let folks in Frankfurt know what your ideas, what your concerns. I saw during the uh, the, the call today, lots of comments. Uh, we're gonna get those questions and comments to the Lieutenant Governor to make sure that she's able to hear your all's virtual conversation as she was talking. So uh, we appreciate you being here. Again, this is part one of a three-part K-12 Kids and COVID series. Uh, we hope to see you next Wednesday, same place, same time. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman, as always, we appreciate what you're doing for the Commonwealth and we appreciate you being with us today. So Thank you all have a so good much. rest of the day. Uh-huh, bye-bye, thanks.